You've tuned in to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes and Dr. Tara Lynn Sell. Your access to success strategies and more to help you move onward and upward with your life. Listen in each week as they interview others who have really taken their essence to the next level and truly unpause their life. Now here are your hosts, Dr. Kelly Estes and Dr. Tara Lynn Sell. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dr. Kelly Estes and I am founder of the Addictions Academy, the Addictions Coach and Rehab Rescue. Welcome to Unpause Your Life. This is a great podcast where we showcase people who have done something extraordinary with their life. I welcome you and I hope you enjoy all of our guests. On my way found a reason to wake up another day. But they needed to Welcome to Unpause Your Life and Unleash Your Inner Badass with Dr. Kelly Estes of the Addictions Coach and the Addictions Academy and my wonderful non-musical co-host. <laughs> Hey, who said I was not musical? I'm just not a musician. Dr. Tara Lynn from drtaralyn.com. Why can't you be a musician? I got a djembe. You want to hang out with me? Well, I don't know. I guess I used to be a musician. We'll get into that in a minute. Our next guest <laughs> is Pete Mills of This Week Kill, and he is a producer, a multi-instrumentalist. That means he plays more than one instrument, which is pretty cool, and founder and lead singer of This Week Kill. Driven by dark wave synths, masculine punk attitude, minimal urban beats, and a neo-emo message, the sweet kill refracts the struggle of addiction in a beautifully unsettling fashion. Welcome, Pete. Hello. Thank you for having me. So let's get right into this. You're telling us that the sweet kill is a female band fronted by a male singer, which I find very interesting. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a multi-instrumentalist, and I happen to play all the instruments on the recording, except for the drums. And what ended up happening is when it came time to start to play live and promote the single Die in Your Eyes, I wanted to actually, being in the heart of Hollywood and the whole Time's Up movement, and everyone's very, like, males are kind of being held to a higher standard, I wanted to then go, you know what, I would love to have the opportunity to play with women in my band. I find that interesting because I'm, you know, I'm a byproduct of the 80s. I think I'm a tad older than you. So we had a lot of female bands back then, and it seemed that we got away from it. And we got more into male, masculine type bands, especially in the 90s with the grunge period. And now it seems like it's starting to make a comeback, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I think a big part of that has to do with, you know, singer songwriters and, and solo artists and the in the advent and the birth of the American Idol movement, the voice and all that, where it becomes very focused on the individual. And a lot of those individuals are women. And, and you know, some are men, of course. But, um, you know, I think because of the personalities, the strength of the Beyonce's, the strength of the Nicki Minaj's, the strength of the Taylor Swift's, it's like I have my nieces are just absolutely all about there's those are the role models for my nieces. So I'm very in tune with kids. I don't know. I just have this thing. I gravitate towards them and vice versa. And so like I kind of get the power they get from these role models. And so I'm essentially the figurehead. I'm the lead singer of the sweet kill. And I thought, you know, I'm the role model. Essentially, I'm the, I'm the spokesperson for this product. But I thought it'd be kind of cool to have the cool yin energy of a female polarizing my crazy male delivery of my performance. And so I thought that, you know, that polarization and that harmony and that compatibility and the differences of that, you know, would be very helpful to celebrate that live. And you've been in other bands as well. I know you were signed to Nikki's label at one point, right? Yeah, Nikki Six from Motley Crue came into my loft in Vancouver and two days later signed us. It was like a drags to riches story, actually. How in the world did he find his way into your loft in Vancouver? I got to hear this. I think a lot of bands from the 80s would come to Vancouver to get away from it all. And, and it's a very picturesque city. It's very nature driven. It's kind of secluded. It's a small town compared to, say, L.A. or New York or whatever. 
And, you know, it was a sort of home away from home for a lot of the 80s bands like Bon Jovi, Metallica, Motley Crue, Aerosmith. They're all up in Vancouver all the time. And one of the songs, Girls, 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 was written from like this dive strip bar in the downtown east side. (laughs) So being up in that climate, when my band started to come up in that environment, a lot of the people that were of substance as far as engineering or producing or being in studios had ties to these bands from that era. And when Nikki wanted to start a record label, a lot of people were saying, you have to sign Flash Bastard, which was the band I was in at the time. And so he got a lot of like, it came to him in waves from different angles. And so when he finally came to Vancouver, he was going to sign another band that was kind of very of that time it was very like a modern rock thing and uh, you know made sense but he opted to go for us because we just kind of as he put it reminded him of himself back in his day growing up what he liked to listen to like the mc5 stooges like glam punk from the new york era was what we were pooling from and that's where he came from from his influences so it was just like a a rite of passage almost that's interesting i'm a huge Nikki six fan and right on. being my husband's a musician and all that, my best friend Anna's husband ran sound for Vince Neil of Motley Crue for years. That's what he did. So I've always been in that area around those people, so to speak. And Nikki's always been considered the untouchable in the addiction space. So I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, I got the opportunity to sit and talk addiction with him. And I got one of his bass guitars, which was pretty cool. Wow. How do you feel about working in that level? in the addiction side and in the music side, when you've got someone like that, who's like pioneering in both now, what do you think about that? I don't want to speak for Nikki, but I'll speak for myself. I wasn't recovered at that stage. So that was a beginning of the end, if you will, of my journey with drugs and alcohol was around the time that started to happen, all that success. So we didn't handle it well. We got kicked off of that tour. I mean, Who gets kicked off of a Motley Crue tour? We did. That was how out of control we were. That was the beginning of the downfall of my relationship with drugs and alcohol. But looking back now, you know, like where I'm at today, this industry is just full of unpredictability and it's full of chaos. At the same time, through my application of the principles of the program, I'm able to navigate those waters. And Nothing ever compares to the drama that ensued in my last five years of addiction. So in that realm, it was the beginning of the end with that signing to Nikki, Nikki's label. And, you know, it was a level of show business. I'll, I'll never forget how good it sounded. I'll never forget how many opportunities were availed to us. We were going to do Howard Stern. We were going to do all these amazing things. But we were the unfunctional addicts. Whereas some people have the ability, even Nikki said, you know, we always did lots of drugs, man, but we always managed to get the show done, whereas we didn't. So it was a different story for us. How did you uh, manage to find your way back from all that? I would imagine you had a reputation then as well. You know what? I thought when we got sober, I really thought that things were just going to, the seas were going to part. It was the other way around. We were almost blacklisted. It was like no one wanted to deal with us. So we imploded as a result of getting sober. And time does this thing. It always has this way about healing certain things. And it definitely healed me to a point where it wasn't about like letting the past define me. My story doesn't define me. My life defines me. And my life is comprised of actions. My life is comprised of creating energy of positivity around those around me from people that serve me coffee in the coffee store to high, high profile premier clients that I work with to recalibrating with my family and a lot of really cool stuff. And I really attribute all of it to the access to power and conscious contact through the application of these steps and principles through the program of recovery. I don't do it. I can't do it. I get kicked off Motley Crue tours. But what the power does through me is creates this venue and this forum and this interaction between you and me right now, Callie. And and that's that's important. And I, I want to give credit to that. So are you in L.A. now or are you in Vancouver? I'm in Los Angeles, right in the heart of Hollywood. Okay. Are you going to the music meetings out there? I've been to a couple, yeah. Music Cares have a Tuesday meeting. Mm -hmm. It used to be actually every, I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays, but then they just consolidated it. But yeah, it's interesting because of all the functions that happen in L.A. Like the, I just came back from the ASCAP Expo and then there's the NAM Expo 
and there's music cares is there and i was you know it's so cool to be a part of some of those meetings there because i met some people i would never have met you know like you know it's so thousands of people networking and then we meet those select few that are having a tough time in the midst of all that or that are new in recovery and we just hung out you know we stick together or we die separate as the book says and it was such a great experience to be like out and about watching everyone get drunk and that's fine good for them right but like to be with people that were like newly in their recovery and being like wow we could actually have a good time watching bands at night after at the expo and not worry about the perils of you know like it was cool it was like a strength in numbers type thing interesting i've been to a couple of the meetings out there in la with a couple musicians that i work with and it's so different. It's because back in the 80s, these are the guys you'd see at the bar getting drunk and getting high. And now they go to a meeting on tour yep. instead of, and, you know, going out and partying and acting crazy. So it's very interesting mm-hmm. how rock and roll and even punk has shifted from let's get fucked up and party to let's go do our show, go to the meeting, go hang out, go to the bus and chill out. It's so different. The mentality now. Yeah. As a musician, I'm seeking, I'm searching. I want to go deep. I don't want to have a frivolous surface talk conversation. I want to, you know, and and that's why I play music because I write these emotional lyrics. I try to embrace the pain to show that there's a way out of it because the delivery of that song that's very dark can actually be an uplifting experience, ironically. And so, yeah, I would love to go to a meeting and get to know what's really going on with people and get tapping into the heart of that because like an AA meeting in LA or anywhere on a Friday night, in any city across the world, that is the heartbeat of that city because those are the people that ran off the rails with the quote unquote partying. And there's like a new kind of party developing where it's like in depth, it's, it's, it's intimate, it's sincere. There's no like fair weather friends in the ideal scenario. It's wonderful. Very nice. Well, Dr. Terry, you're not saying anything. I'm just listening over here. This is fascinating. I'm I'm like, there's such a big difference between AA meetings. I'm from Wisconsin. So in Wisconsin, you know, in the basement of a church, I would guess, versus what you're talking about. It's a whole different style of being. I don't know. It's just, it's fascinating to me, but I'm still kind of rolling around over here about this all-female band. And I want to know the band members, are they also in recovery or What's the deal with that? How do you manage that? You know, I, I wish, you know, they were in recovery. Not that they have a problem with it. It would just be kind of cool to kind of like then go all go to meetings together. But some meetings are open. If You know, when we start to take this the show on the road, they're more than welcome to come to open meetings with me. But again, like I just take that program of recovery into every aspect of my life. And I have really strong rapports with people, especially those that love the music that I write and I give them, you know, all I got. I give everyone all I got. And there's a bond between us. And whether they're in recovery or not, we're all human at the end of the day. So there's that respect. I've got a question for you. With your music, is that your medium for connecting to people and talking about sobriety? Or is your music separate from your sobriety? It's a really good question. And I was talking with my sponsor about that last night because I pretty much from a very young age knew what my path was. I, I didn't go to university. I barely squeaked by through high school. I did it to placate my parents. Plus, I loved playing football. So I just wanted to win state, if you will. Province is where I'm from, win the province. And to me, like a musician, everything to do with my life has been music. So I just go like, that's something other than myself. I didn't ask for that. I didn't go like, oh, I really want to do this. It's like, it just happened to me. Like, I just happened to play more than one instrument. I just happened to end up being in a band two weeks after buying a bass. So it's all connected. And I've devoted my life in step three to this power. So this power is bestowed upon me these gifts and I can use it or I can lose it. And I choose to use it. So I, I find that they're exactly, they're not mutually exclusive. They're synonymous with each other. There's this, I think that when music gets moralistic, when we when one one decides to censor it because it's too dark, I think that that's when it's compromised. Because I'm a recovered alcoholic, I have no problem going into the depths of what that mindset was like to then, you know, showcase in my lyrics to kind of create an alternative, to create the feeling musically, melodically, as the song evolves, to have this like release into like this world of hope. Because that's how I felt every time I left my sponsor at the coffee shop. Whenever I'd get up from that coffee table after our hour, two hour, three hour discussion, I'd feel hope. I have the energy to be shifted. And I think that music is such a wonderful medium to be able to do that because it's a universal language. I've traveled to Russia 
when played with musicians on a dime, the, the songs that I've written, they get it on a visceral level. They love it. You know, and that's to me like just a testament to the power of the emotion conveyed in music. And it's the same feeling I get from a really good speaker in AA. It's the same feeling. And it's love. Have you been on tour with this your all female band? Not yet. This current iteration is what it, what we just discussed, but I did test drive these songs in Russia and in London just to sort of test those markets because I wanted to like refine. And when I make the big push, like what I'm doing right now, I had to have certain things. For example, the music didn't have live drums on it. And so when I got back from Russia, that was the takeaway. I needed live drums. So then, you know, I got Darren King from Mute Math to come in and play live drums. So, but I'm guessing though, you have your band in place, right? Yes. So what's the biggest thing you've learned about working with female musicians? That there's an intuition that is unspoken and there's an energy that can be tapped into. And one has to be very, what's the word, respectful. And then in uplifting at the same time, as the band leader, my role is to help them understand the emotion behind what it is. So we've had great in-depth discussions about like where I've come from in recovery. I get to know them. I, I do what I do as a sponsor. I inquire, I investigate, I probe, I ask leading questions. And I try to, what I try to do in that realm is to create the atmosphere of care, concern, and love and trust and intimacy. Because that to me is like, I, I'm a big believer, you know, in my sports days in high school, that you perform how you practice. And so we practice a lot and we get to know each other because I think that music is a conversation. So it's one thing that like to be able to play together and it sounds good and their skill meets my skill and, or their skill is better than my skill, which uplifts my skill or vice versa. But at the end of the day, it's about conversations about that trust. So, you know, there's like a bravado with a bunch of guys all like that hot energy of like, you know, (laughs) show off time. And so this isn't that. It's way different. And I'm embracing it. And I'm totally it's new for me, actually. You know, because I'm also an 80s girl. And the only thing I can. Gosh, who was the one guy that did those videos with the women with the hair slipped back? Anybody know him? Robert Palmer. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, That's what I keep thinking of. Oh, my God. Seriously? That's what you remember from the 80s. I'm like Joan Jett, Pat Benatar. Great. <laughs> you think of Robert Palmer. Seriously. It's one hit one. Oh, yeah, I think it's good. I think, you know what? If I had a dime for everyone who's mentioned Robert Palmer, Addicted See? to Love. Yeah. It, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, the guy I go, like, yeah, I go uh, male fronted all female. They go, oh, you mean like Robert Palmer? You know, the lats are wrong and you're not <laughs> you old. Know? Your sweat is not your own. <laughs> Those are the best lyrics. I mean, your sweat is not your own. I don't think anybody was caring about the lyrics. <laughs> right, right. That was really the hypersexualization of women, right? Mm-hmm. They clearly weren't playing, and they were clearly models. So, <laughs> clearly. you know, yeah. So who has inspired you the most throughout this journey that you're on? Huh, that's a really good question. I don't want to get too esoteric, but I would say... There's one guy from Texas that frequents the LA meetings here. He's considered probably an addiction specialist. He's 40 years sober. He runs a lot of addiction seminars. And he said, you know, you got to have three intimate relationships. What are they, Pete? And at the time, my ex fiance and I were having a falling out and, you know, it was kind of tumultuous. So I was like, you know, her, my sponsor and some guys I sponsor. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, one of those is right. You need to have three intimate relationships, one with yourself, one with God, and one with your sponsor. And everything else is a byproduct. So my inspirations are really pooled from my relationship with the help that I get to access power through my conscious contact, through my sponsors, and through my relationship to myself. And then as the byproduct of that is I get to find new music. Like like one woman that just blew my mind, who's an up-and-coming star, is this woman. I think she's from Norway. Her name's Sigrid. And it's just like the youthful, like she was going to, throw away music. She wasn't going to do it, but she just reluctantly decided to give it a shot. And she's like really up on the rise right now. But her, The Weeknd, some Canadian guys, you know, Drake, The Weeknd, for whatever reason, I decided to start listening to Drake and I couldn't stop. And I don't know what that is because, you know, I grew up in a glam punk band. So I think that my, my production tendencies tend to be competitively contemporary. So I do listen to what's with, I do have my finger on the pulse. And then I'm also very selective. So I would say that that sobriety construct is my inspiration. And then it manifests in like modern urban type production. 
Very cool. Well, I have one last question for you. All right. And this, this is the one that we ask everybody at the tail end. So what is the most badass thing you've ever done? Even something nobody else might know about. Free sobriety or? Whatever you consider badass. Badass. Okay. I think badass at one point in sobriety, I was sponsoring 20 guys. I was living with my girlfriend at the time and I was doing 13 Korean pop albums in one year, plus my own passion project, which is the resurgence of that flash bastard band. When we broke up, we got back together in sobriety and things kind of started lifting off again. And that moment I, I would consider was the ultimate badass moment of being able to do my passion project, have a private investor, do a song every two days for a whole year and sponsor as many people as I did. That to me was like a badass moment. That was very type A badass. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah. Pick off Molly Crew trumps that. I mean, that is like the ultimate. They're a party band. I would have given you that one. <laughs> yeah, okay. I thought about going there, but I was like, you know what? That was a while ago, you know? You know, I'm not going to give it too much credence. But yeah, that was badass. That's for sure. All right. See, so there's pre sobriety and there's post sobriety. So that was, I give you the post sobriety. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So we are out of time. How do people find you? If you go to anywhere on Instagram or Facebook, it's The Sweet Kill. And we're up on Spotify. And there's only one The Sweet Kill. So nice. check out the video after YouTube. There's a video up there of all these women that are friends of mine that are actors in LA. And we've done some... Remember that 80s band, Godly and Cream? Remember that song they had, Cry? Or the video where they would take these face morphs of like the finger into like these women and to these kids. And it was just a weird vibe. Well, I took that inspiration and we created this video, Die in Your Eyes, of all these women that morphed into one. And there's just only one goddess and every woman has the capacity to tap into that. And, you know, may the God in me speak to the goddess in you. And that kind of, that's the energy undertone of that video. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show. You've been listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Callie Estes and my lovely Midwestern co-host. Dr. Terrell and Sal. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show today. Head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a comment or review of what you think. Or contact us at 1-800-706-0318. If you want to be on our show, feel free to email or call. And if you have a topic, feel free to email or call as well. Thanks for listening to Unpause Your Life. For show notes and more, head on over to unpauseyourlife.com. Big shout out to recoveryinnovators.com for help producing this show. Thank you, guys. I took a walk down the long road Where they said that I should go on my way found a reason to wake up another day but they needed to show you all the things that you won't do find faith or religion but nothing to show for it Down the dark road Where they said that I shouldn't go I knew the dangers of flying Now I'm so far from silent ground But they knew